Hey guys, in today's lecture, we're gonna talk about the principles of paramedic pharmacology. Now, paramedic pharmacology is one of the most important aspects of paramedic practice because the drugs that you guys will be given as qualified paramedics are pretty powerful and the patients rely on you to be able to administer them safely as well as monitor the effects. And that's after you've made the initial assessments and identified that the patient is indicated from in the first place. So pharmacology is something that does form a big part of paramedic practice. But not only that, if you look at the literature, it's an area of paramedic practice that has the largest error rate and therefore is um, a, an area that requires some serious consideration to the factors when, when administering this to try and help our patients. Now the purpose of this session is to look at the key terms related to drug pharmacology because when you give a drug, you've got to have an understanding of how that drug is going to work on the body. We're going to look at a number of key drug routes because therefore you've got to have a, an understanding of these so that you can make a decision as to which one is the quickest or the best given the circumstance that you're presented with. And we're going to talk about the safety checks as well because safety is everything in paramedic practice. So let's first start by um, looking at a couple of, of terms here. So pharmacology is the study of drugs. Pharm is the drug and, and ology is the study of. Pharmacology, the study of drugs. Now, when you guys are given the drugs, you've got to think about the, all of these things here that we've just summarized, the best and most suitable route. Now, some drugs, you've got to understand that drugs act differently depending on the route that you give. They act quicker depending on the drugs that you give. Some are not suitable for some routes and other routes are just not accessible. For example, if someone's um, significantly injured in their left arm and their right arm, you're not going to be able to cannulate that patient. So the route is really, really important to look at. Bioavailability, drug half-life, indications and contraindications, cautions and safety checks. So bioavailability really is about the amount of drug left to work on the, on the body once the body has tried to destroy the drug. So in other words, let's take um, an oral route. You take the drug, you crunch it, you're, you're starting to break it down with your teeth mechanically. Then the salivary glands inside your mouth start to break it down chemically. Eventually it will go down into your stomach where your stomach will do this as well. And there's also gastric juices there that will continue to break it down. Eventually that drug will move into the duodenum and into the hepatic portal circulation. You can Google these terms at any time. Now imagine that the drug has now gone into the bloodstream and eventually it's got, some of it has got onto the receptors that it's supposed to be, you know, where it's supposed to be. Now, as well as going through all that system, there's also something called a plasma cell. So not all of that drug that gets into the blood will be available to do the job. Some of it is attached to the plasma cells and, and rendered you know, useless because the plasma cell will take it away for excretion. But bioavailability really is about that very small amount of drug that we, um, we have allowed to get into our body and it's working on the cell. That's bioavailability and every drug has a bioavailability. The drug half-life is about the amount of drug your body is actually destroying and therefore um, how long it takes your body to do that. So for example, if adrenaline, for example, has got a half-life of three to five minutes, that means that your body is break breaking it down and your liver is breaking it down. It's broken half the drug down after three to five minutes. Therefore, you can know after three to five minutes, most of the drug has been destroyed. Now, indications and contraindications. Indications are when you would give a drug. So let's say you've got someone with asthma. An indication for treating asthma is salbutamol. An indication for adrenaline, for example. What are the indications for adrenaline? Uh, Life-threatening asthma and anaphylaxis. Now, there's also a contraindication. That means situations when you absolutely would not give a drug. So indication means when you would give the drug and contraindication means when you absolutely would not give the drug. Now caution is something you also need to be mindful of. Just because something is not contraindicated, but it's in a caution instead, it also means you've got to look at it. So if something says caution, do not give this drug in pregnant women, um, or be cautious around it, you've got to do your homework. You've got to be able to stand up in a court of law and say, I read this and this is, these are the steps that I took to be able to make sure it was safe. So I might speak to the pregnant woman and say, have you had this before? You might consider the clinical situation. Well, if I didn't give this drug, 
the outcome would have been this. So a caution is still something you have to think about. Then there's the safety checks. So you've got to go through the, the right processes before you, you give the drug. Now, drug routes, intramuscular, intravenous, per aurum, per rectum, subcutaneous, intraosseous. So they're the ones that we're going to talk about. So intramuscular just means into the muscle. Uh, now, when you're given an intramuscular injection, you have to try and remember that once you've injected it into the muscle, you don't have any control over what happens. So, for example, you don't have any control over the rate or how much. So, for example, most intramuscular routes um, expect you only to give three to five milliliters. So they're only very small doses. Once you've given that three to five milliliters, that's it. The muscle will just absorb that drug and you'll start to see a response as appropriate. Whereas in comparison to intravenous, you can give a dose, then you can stop and you can give another dose and you can stop and you can reassess. That's what we call titrate to response. So I'm gonna give this drug titrate to response. So in other words, I'm gonna give some titrate, titrate, titrate. Oh, they've responded, I'm not gonna give any more. You can actually do that. Paorum is another method for, for uh, drug administration, it just means swallowing it. Now, the unfortunate thing about PO is that it's a very slow drug route. It's about 10 to 15 minutes. Intravenous has an absorption rate of about 30 seconds because you're going straight into the bloodstream. Intramuscular has anywhere from two to five minutes depending on the health of the muscles and the circulation in the muscles and the situation and the type of drug and how fast you give it and the volume that you give it. Per rectum is, is rectal, um, through, through the rectal route, remembering that your anal cavity has got a high vascular concentration, so lots of circulation, a highly effective route. Some, um, some ambulance services allow you to use it and a good example is PR route for benzodiazepines if someone's having a convulsion. Other services just say, we, we're not going to use that. Instead, you can use intranasal. Subcutaneous is underneath the fat. And the, the clear example here is using um, insulin for hyperglycemic patients. However, most ambulance services do not allow paramedics to give it because it's a, it's a bit of a, a, a dangerous drug to give if you haven't had any specific training. And then finally, intraosseous or into the bone is a route that you guys can give if you're, if you're um, administering um, drugs that, in, that would have otherwise been used intravenously. So for example, the, the rate and of absorption for intraosseous infusion is, is equivalent to intravenous infusion. So it's a very good route. Now, historically, paramedics never used to have this in their scope of practice. Then when ambulance services introduced it, you used to only give it to patients who required, who were in cardiac arrest or unconscious. Now, by today's standards, Intensive care paramedics tend to be the ones who use this in conscious patients because when you administer something through the IO route, it's extremely painful for the patient, but it is a route that you've got available to you. So we've mentioned bioavailability, but you really do have to try and understand what it means in terms of um, how important it is to drug administration. We've said that what it is, is the amount of drug available at the end when it's been through the system. But just have a look at this. This really is a calculation. Um, this really is, shows you the movement of drugs. So somebody eats it, goes down through the pharynx, the esophagus, into the stomach. It gets broken down by the diet, by the, um, by the stomach itself through all the methods, goes into the next stage of the system, it gets absorbed. Uh, in the duodenum and in the digest, rest of the digestive tract and into the blood. So eventually it gets into the blood. And every drug that you give your patient will have a bioavailability calculation. So in other words, um, have a look at the bioavailability. So for example, when you take paracetamol, this is, it doesn't have this number. It might say the bioavailability is 35%. That's because by the time you've given it and it's broken it all down, there's only 35% left. So 35% of that tablet um, will work. Whereas if you give paracetamol IV, it might say 99% because the only thing that's going to interfere with that drug working when you give an IV route is the plasma cells. And there's very little else to, to affect it. So do be mindful that bioavailability is very important, particularly if you're giving a drug um, and you're trying to consider how fast you need it to work and how much you need it to work. 
And this is why, let's say you've got the drug adrenaline. If you're giving it IV, you'll give a lot smaller dosage than if you're giving it uh, IM, for example, because of the, the, the bioavailability. So this really is a term that you need to get your head around as a paramedic. Now, what we've said about half-life is that it, the half-life is the amount of time it takes your liver to break down half the drug. Now, half-life varies from person to person because if you think about what's happening, I've just told you all the different things that need to occur to break down the drug. So that means you have to have a, a healthy functioning liver. It means you have to have um, good circulation in the stomach. You've got to have good produce, production of, of, of acids. So all these things you have to have for your half-life to be you know, effective enough. So half-life is the amount of time it takes for your body to break down half the drug, but that's just a very, it does vary from person to person. As it says here, there are many different things that get in the way of a half-life calculation. But as the paramedic, if you know a drug is going to be broken down in three minutes, you can expect to see other signs and symptoms within five minutes. So for example, if you are um, giving a patient adrenaline for anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis is a life-threatening condition. If you know that it takes your body five minutes to two, two, well, two to three to five, depending on which text you read, depending on which route you go, let's say, let's say three to five minutes it takes to break down adrenaline. After five minutes, you're gonna start potentially seeing what's called secondaries. In other words, there's no adrenaline left in the system, um, therefore the symptoms could come back. Now, in my experience of using adrenaline intramuscularly for life-threatening um, asthma and for um, anaphylaxis, it's worked really, really well and then hasn't been any secondaries, but it doesn't mean it won't happen because your body eliminates it after two to three minutes or three to five minutes. Now, indications and contraindications is something we've, we've just recently touched on, but what we said was that you, they are, allow you to recognize when your ambulance service indicates you to use it. Now, I find this part interesting because let's say you compare an ambulance service protocol between one state or another. What you'll find is that one service will say, yes, you can give IEM adrenaline for, let's say, asthma. Another one might say, no, you can't do that unless you're an intensive care paramedic. So they're always slightly different, but regardless, you have to follow your own clinical practice guidelines and follow them. Even if you know that, that asthma, for example, is treated, life-threatening asthma is treated with intramuscular adrenaline, but you're not allowed to give it, then that means you're not allowed to give it in your scope of practice. It's just the way it is. Now, there was a case last year whereby a paramedic crew went to a patient who had life-threatening asthma and they knew that they had to give adrenaline, but they weren't allowed to give it because it, wasn't, it was outside of their scope of practice. Now, they didn't give it and the patient died. It was very unfortunate, but they were staying within the guidelines that they were given. Now, of course, um, they, it went to court and the, um, the, the ambulance service was sued, but the, the ambulance service protected their paramedics because they had followed their protocols. Now, if you go outside of your protocols and it works, that's great. But if you go outside and it doesn't work and the patient's harmed, then you're in a lot of hot water. So not a lot of paramedics will risk their own career. So it just gives you an idea of how your guidelines don't always do what's best for the patient. But if you want to stay safe as a paramedic, then you've got to follow them. Now, it's unfortunate that that's not always what's in the patient's best interests. And that's what this term vicarious liability is. That means that if you followed your ambulance service guidelines and it goes wrong, they will cover you because you've done everything that you should have done. Okay, now cautions. Most drug guidelines will list cautions. Now, in my experience of working in ambulance services, they all have it. Now, you've got to be able to go through the cautions and rule them out. A caution means to act carefully so in other words, a bit like what I just said, one service might say you can give a drug for this condition, another doesn't. Now, I'll give you an example of how cautions have changed over the years. Historically, when you were giving aspirin for an acute coronary syndrome, a contraindication used to be if patients were actively on warfarin. Now, warfarin is a drug that sticks to plasma cells and it floats around in the blood. And then aspirin will come along and knock the warfarin off the plasma cells, meaning that your patient is more likely to have a bleed.
But over the years, the thinking around it has changed. If that patient's having an acute coronary syndrome, therefore needs a, a, a dosage of aspirin, they've moved the, the warfarin over the years into a caution rather than a contraindication because not giving the aspirin is much more detrimental than allowing a, a 300 milligram bolus of aspirin to interfere with the warfarin processes. So you still have to think about it. This is where your clinical decision making and your critical thinking and your communication and team working comes into your uh, safe clinical practice. A caution means you can administer a drug. However, you must have made consideration for all items listed in a caution. And again, just make sure you can rule them out before you give it because you may be asked to defend yourself in a court of law later. Now your safety procedures really do come down to you as the individual and I cannot emphasize enough that you go through some kind of process of safety check-in. Just get yourselves on the internet and, and have, a look at the different, um, have a look at the different cases that have been heard in courts about patients who have been harmed by paramedics making drug errors. You do not want to be one of those patients. So uh, paramedics that, that harm patients. So make sure you check it's the right drug. You can do this by holding it to your patient, to your paramedic colleague and saying, what is this drug? So you wouldn't say to them, is this drug adrenaline? You would say, what is this? Get them to read it. Because if there's a drug right next to adrenaline and it looks very similar to adrenaline and you've pulled out the wrong drug, they're more like, your crewmates more likely to say, yeah, yeah, it's adrenaline because it looks the same uh, and it could be the same. So get them to read it. Make sure the container is not damaged because therefore the drug's not contaminated. If it is, choose another drug and report that. Make sure it's in date. Now this is not unsafe from the viewpoint of contamination. However, it's unsafe from the viewpoint that the drug will start to, to be less efficient if it becomes out of date. Check to make sure there's no obvious discoloration or that the packaging is not damaged because again, if there's any type of damage to the drug, then it can be a problem for your patient. Um, and reassess that you are confident of the chosen route of administration. So go back through and consider the bioavailability, go back through your guidelines to make sure that it's in your scope of practice and you're not acting outside of them. And then finally, make a check against your clinical practice guidelines. In other words, get your guideline out and just double check the contraindications, check the right dosage and routes and all those things. Do not try and have any bravado about, I'm a great paramedic because I know my drugs. Those are the paramedics who make drug errors. It's been proven by research. Just get into the, into the drug errors and have a look online. There's plenty of it for you to look at. You need to be checking your guidelines, uh, um, checking your guidelines for all of these things that we're talking about and get into the habit now whilst you're in the training mode before you go out into clinical practice and you harm yourself, harm someone, because you're trying to prove how smart you are. Remember that once you've given the drug, you cannot take it back. Okay guys, so I hope you've enjoyed this session. What we've done in this session is we've looked at the key terms relating to drug pharmacology, including bioavailability, half-life, indications, contraindications, portions. We've looked at a range of drug routes, including intraosseous, intramuscular, intravenous, oral, rectum. These are the key routes that you're going to have available to you as a paramedic. And if you're familiar with them now, then you're going to just find it so much easier to be able to treat a patient and select a route when you get into your workshops, um, as well as when you go to university or go and work for an employer as well, because some of you may have never heard these terms before, and that's fine as well. And of course, most importantly, we've looked at the necessary safety checks that you must undertake before administering a drug because really this is the most important part of paramedic practice, making sure that you are safe and keeping yourself safe, keeping your patients safe. I hope you've enjoyed this session, guys. You can use the key terms from this lecture to go off and do some more reading. And I look forward to talking to you guys again shortly. Take care.